How's your day, Stephanie? Thanks for joining us. It's going good. It's kind of a busy day today, but that's all right. Yeah, same here. Are you in Sacramento right I now? I am. I am. Cool. I'm just a little northeast of you in Tahoe. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, and you're ready to, you can go whenever you'd like. We are recording. All right, thank you. Thanks, everyone, for your patience with the technical difficulties. Um, let me get these gamer headphones on. So we're going to game today with Stephanie in The Last Prisoner Project. And we're going to be talking about restorative justice in the cannabis industry. And this topic is super near and dear to my heart, uh, being in the cannabis industry and then always wondering why cannabis is even illegal and why it has been used as a tool of propaganda to fill prison systems, uh, whether those are minor infractions or asset forfeitures and all the fun things that the government likes to do to gain profit in the private prison system. But today, my guest is Stephanie Shepard of The Last prisoner project and stephanie grew up in sacramento california the youngest of seven children in 2005 stephanie moved from california to new york to pursue her dream of selling real estate in 2010 stephanie was convicted of conspiracy to distribute 1000 kilos of marijuana for anyone that doesn't quite know what a kilo is that is 2.2 pounds of marijuana so 2.2 times a thousand i believe that is the equivalent of one ton um, as a first-time nonviolent offender, Stephanie was sentenced to 10 years in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. On June 5th, 2019, the ankle monitor was removed and she was placed on federal probation for the next five years. Stephanie now serves as a development associate with Last Prisoner Project and is adamantly working towards her goal of working within the legal cannabis industry while advocating with LPP and the fight for restorative justice for those who have suffered as she has from cam cannabis criminalization. And for those of you that don't know about The Last Prisoner Project, uh, they uh, use a three-pronged approach to securing full, capital letters, full freedom for the communities they serve through intervention, advocacy, and awareness campaigns. The Last Prisoner Project works to redress the past and continuing harms of these unjust laws and policies. And as the United States moves away from criminalization of cannabis, it's giving rise to a major new industry. There remains the fundamental injustice inflicted upon those who have suffered criminal convictions and the consequences of these convictions. And um, being a cannabis operator and a founder of a brand that works with cannabis, um, in the back of your mind, you should always have like, why should we all have the chance to pursue an industry, pursue building a business, pursue profits while there's still thousands of people still in jails and prisons around the United States and veterans of the, the, uh, legacy cannabis market. Um, we're a proud donor to the last prisoner project. And they're a nonprofit organization dedicated to releasing cannabis prisoners and helping them rebuild their lives. And they were founded in 2019 and they aim to free every, and that, let me repeat that, every nonviolent cannabis prisoner and aid them in rebuilding their lives. So uh, for many of you that don't understand the war on drugs, the war on drugs uh, has been a 50 year war that is failing miserably and you've probably seen the funny kitschy memes that go around congratulations to drugs for winning the war on drugs um it is a colossal failure and cannabis has really just been used as a tool of propaganda to fill prison systems so um, at medicine box my team and i are super proud to be able to uh, be partners with um, an organization um, as astute as the last prison project. And today to actually speak to someone 
uh, boots on the ground, doing the service, doing the work with LPP as an advocate and someone that has experienced firsthand the grips of how tragic the war on drugs has been, especially to black, brown, minorities, marginalized communities. Um, do your research, look at what happened to um, many of these marginalized communities um, throughout the United States, and then question where you're putting your money with certain products and how you're spending your money. And one thing before we get going in this interview <clears throat> is what we like to say at Medicine Box is whether you are a recreational user, a medical cannabis user, a business owner, you should also be a full-throated advocate for this plant and the people that have been affected by the war on drugs. So um, without further ado, uh, Stephanie Shepard, thank you for joining us from Sacramento. Um, I'm Brian Chapman, the founder of Medicine Box, and I am not too far from you up in the Sierra um, Mountains here in Lake Tahoe. So um, we're just going to get right into it. Uh, would love to hear your story, Stephanie, and what brought you to the to the world of cannabis reform. Uh, thank you, Brian. Thank you for having me, and thank you, Medicine Box. Um, it's brands like yours that keep us going and allow us to do the work that we do, along with you know donations from patients. And so it's very, very much appreciated. Um, what brings me to cannabis reform? Uh, I never thought I would be here. That's for one thing. Um, I first consumed at 28 years old. So <laughs> uh, it's not something that's been in my life my entire you know, adult life. But in 2010, I did get involved with a cannabis case. And I never thought that I would actually be sentenced to what they were telling me, which was 10 years, the mandatory minimum. I said, I'm a, at the time I was selling real estate. I was, I don't know. I, my life was going fine. I got involved in the case and it's like my past didn't matter. It was now this is what you are and that's it. Um, but I was, I was found guilty of conspiracy to distribute a thousand or more kilos of marijuana in New York, where it is now legal. Um, it's a bittersweet, um, a bittersweet thing to see the legalization happen in the same place that still holds so many traumatic experiences for me. Um, going to court and being remanded and never going home again. So I was sentenced, first time nonviolent, to 10 years. And it took me about five years to really believe that I was going to do this time. So I think in a way that kind of made it easier for me to do the time because every day I felt like this is going to be found to be a mistake and I am going to be called to be released. So that went on and on. And one day I went to church, heard a sermon, something struck me and said, no, this is it. This is the time that you're doing. You're doing this time and nobody can help you. So by the time I figured that out, I only had you know five more years to go. <laughs> and I did a drug program called RDAP. It's a residential drug abuse program because of my addiction to marijuana. And the funny thing about that is I was on pretrial for one year prior to, to actually going to prison. So whereas I was being monitored, I was still you know out and about and free to move around. And I had to test randomly. Every day I had to call to see if I had to go and, and give a, a urine test. Never failed it once. I was like, yeah, I like cannabis. I don't like it more than freedom. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I had, I had to choose. 
But of course, I'm choosing freedom for the time being. So to go in and say, yes, I want a year off. I'm addicted to marijuana. And I said I would never do it. And my father got sick. And when my father got sick, I just wanted to get home as quickly as possible. So I was like, bring it on. Like, I'll do it. I finished the, the program and came home a year early. Um, when I got home, I was still on four months of aftercare. <laughs> so that was great. Uh, but after going through all of that and last prisoner project was just getting started. So they had been just, you know, two women, Mary and Sarah and the help of Stacey Angelo, um, just doing what they could. Uh, I got out, I went to a fundraiser in San Francisco where one of my friends from prison that I met in prison was speaking and she told her story. And when she told her story, I just, I knew that that was a really powerful tool in this fight is hearing from someone who's actually been through it, seeing the face of someone. Now you can say, you know, someone who's been through it. Mm. So I began to utilize the last prisoner project's platform. And at the time I took the first job out. You only have two weeks to find a job out of prison. I started working at Starbucks. Finally, when I felt like I was ready to, to actually leave the nest of Starbucks and, and get a real job, so to speak, um, I was approached by last prisoner project and they said, we would like you to work with us. Like we've been wanting you to, we just Mm. had to, and that's how I ended up as a development associate with Last Prison Project. So turning your story into a triumph, really. And uh, just to rewind a little bit, you know, conspiracy. So the conspiracy to distribute. So for anyone that's listening, that doesn't always necessarily mean that you have to have the thing you're distributing in your hand and giving it to someone else that's exchanging money. That could be mean that you could have sent it text message or voicemail or been seen with someone with the uh 1000 kilos right was that well the the funny thing is it was an ex-boyfriend he went to prison or he got arrested and six months after he was arrested i got a call from his attorney saying hey can i talk to you about his case i was being a little bit nosy i said sure I went in and spoke to him. He said, you know, he has a bad heart. He's had a pacemaker put in. He needs a heart transplant. He needs to get healthy before sentencing. If I can get him medical bond, can he stay at your house? Mm. That's a conspiracy. (laughs) Me being the person I am, I said yes. Mm -hmm. As soon as I said yes, an hour after going to court, they're fighting it. They say you're involved. I still worked in the same place, lived in the same place, drove the same car, had the same phone number. They never came for me mm-hmm. until I agreed to give him a place to, to get healthy before he went to prison. So I went in, spoke to the judge. An hour later, I was hit. A week later, I'm getting dressed to go pick him up because the judge said he found me responsible and credible. And he re- recommended he be released into my custody. I'm getting dressed. Ding dong. DEA jacket guy, FBI. <laughs> Ice. It's like, okay, uh, we have a warrant for your arrest. And the conspiracy was for people who were caught with the product mm-hmm. saying it was her. So I got for cooperating witnesses saying it was me I was doing it but the people in the van with the weed and the money never went to jail Mm. that's the crazy 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 part about that's 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 the crazy thing about the conspiracy laws and racketeering laws and you never know who you're dealing with or who you're communicating with 
Um, and they're sn sneaky little buggers, aren't they? <laughs> aren't they though? The, the feds are sneaky little buggers, but we don't need to go down that rabbit hole. No. So, um, so you, you, you teamed up with the last prison project by turning your story into a triumph. Um, obviously you have a very exceptional story to tell. Um, and that's great. That's being a full throated advocate, as we say at medicine box. And so tell us about some of the projects LPP is getting behind in states and certain counties. And uh, we know you're working to pass a bill in Virginia and any others that we should be aware of right now. Our, our policy team um, is amazing. We have people who have not gone through this, but are dedicated to this. And so policy for me is a number one change that needs to happen because with that change in policy, there doesn't need to be expungement. There doesn't need to be re-entry. There doesn't need to be release. Like, let's change it at the root. I'll take my, my punishment for what I did at the time because it was illegal. Why now? Why are people still sitting there? Mm. Find them like any other business that's without a license and let's keep it pushing. Mm -hmm. But for me, the policy team, they're working in Virginia, they're working in California, New Orleans, um, places where there's things happening. So they have bills in New Jersey, we have campaigns in New Jersey running. Um, the policy team for me is really the root of everything. I like to think that, and then we move on to reentry and release. Release is so important because there's people doing large, um, large numbers away from their families, life, yeah. 60 years, 40 years away from their families. If we can elevate those, those cases and, and bring people to, to want to be involved and get people home from doing life or get every person home. That's, that's our goal. But then there's relief. There's re-entry. Re-entry is another, another ball game altogether. Yeah. So we've got to put some work behind that because you've already been traumatized and don't get it um, confused by how someone handles it or they look like they have things together. Coming home with a felony after doing a 10 year sentence. Yeah, I'm a little bit messed up a little bit. So we've got to, to make it easier on people and mm. support them instead of shutting them out for something that a lot of people are making a really good living for their family mm -hmm. and beyond. We need to embrace those people coming home because they were doing it even before it was okay to do it. They were doing it and taking that punishment. And yeah. so to have them come home, be embraced, that's what I love about our reentry program and communicating with constituents is they don't have to feel like I felt sitting in prison, seeing the industry booming outside. Yeah. While I'm sitting inside still with no help. I didn't know of an LPP or any other organization that would help. Um, so I felt like helpless, thrown away. I thought I'm definitely doing all this time while this is booming outside. They don't have to feel like that. We communicate with them. We let them know that they're not going to come home in the same circumstance that I came home in through our letter writing campaign, through our newsletter. Yeah. So really that those programs to me are a number one. Expungement is great, but even if you don't get expunged, you still have to figure what your way. All right. Well, that, that re-entry you mentioned really struck me when you said you only had two weeks to find a job and by the grace of God, you landed at Starbucks in, in two weeks. Mm -hmm. that, that's not that much time. 
being in prison for a decade and then coming out and probably just going, wow, what's, there's a tree, there's cars, there's, I have to find an apartment to live in. I need to catch up with my family. I need to get on my feet first. Two weeks, there's a lot of jobs that you can't even get a, in California. Everyone's flaky here. You don't even get a call back in two weeks. The crazy so thing is that, I had that reentry, you nailed it. I had an ankle monitor on when I went to my interview and uh, I thought it would just be the manager, but it ended up being like the regional manager there. And, and she asked why my schedule was so strict. And that's when I had to tell her and say it out loud to someone for the first time that this was my situation. This is why I can, cannot stay any later than this time I put on this piece of paper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Otherwise the now, marshals will show up. <laughs> yeah. With, so with reentry and just a, a bit of like the psychology of a felon and someone that was in prison, did you experience any like judgments from coworkers or the person that hired you? Because I would imagine uh, the people that I know, friends that, have had felonies it's really difficult for them to find their their way back into society so lpp is doing a lot of work with that re-entry and that i'm sure like you mentioned trauma you know there's there's definitely trauma from being locked up and then the the, the mental health hurdle to get over that like hey yeah i have this thing that says i'm a felon on a piece of paper but that doesn't mean i'm a terrible person i'm not going to be knocking down your doors with with an axe and coming at you you know so i'd imagine that's another process of getting over and it sounds like lpp is helping you know with the expungement then the release and with re-entry i'm sure that's part of the the package right um for sure it's a very heavy label to carry um and, and you talk about getting an apartment. Well, it's the number two question on, on the security portion of a rental application. So what are you supposed to do at that point? Are you going right. to tell the truth and not get the apartment? Are you not going to have somewhere to live? So there's these barriers and these, these roadblocks that are put up for you that people don't really realize and don't really see. Yeah. And it's not only two weeks to get a job and or risk violation and going back to prison, but just the, the overall weight of having to see billboards advertising delivery while you're on your way to see your probation officer across town where you don't have a car like it's so much that goes into and this is in the first two weeks so yeah. yeah you definitely hit the nail on the head when you said that 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 amount of time does not even begin you shouldn't even be in contact with people for the first two weeks honestly yeah yo I, it's like yo mr and mrs probation i need to decompress i need to chill for a second like <laughs> i want i want to bask in like some sunshine and go to the park and <laughs> eat and some that's, eat that's, some takeout and go, that's one go. of the things that we try to do listen when lpp asks us what do people need that's why i love that we have multiple felons cannabis felons on our team and when they asked us what do you guys need and they listen and one of my big things was we need time to decompress so if that means an airbnb for the first week that you're out like that's huge it should be like, more than it should be like three months i mean there's people that come back from burning man that need a whole month to decompress <laughs> i mean I mean, let's face it, your nervous system is probably completely shot when you're coming out. And then you're you're going back to New York and it's just like loud and traffic and trash everywhere and crazy people. And, you know, and you're like, I have to get a job because the system told me to get a job yeah. in two weeks. Right. So. Um, so I was 52, just, 52 year old working at Starbucks. Great. <laughs> that's a lot of macchiatos, you know. Mm -hmm. 
too. So um, LPP works with other organizations, I know. So how does LPP work with activists in, in the field and organizations like the Weldon Project, Mission Green, that are also pushing for release and expungement? And how do you all collaborate together, you know, strength by numbers? Definitely. Um, working with other organizations on the criminal justice side in every state, because we are nationwide and we help everyone nationwide, but we're a, a new small org. So we can't be everywhere. So having these relationships with people like m for mm and um, other organizations like you mentioned and Freedom Grow, uh, being they're, they're in different places. And so it's nice to have that network to say, hey, we have a, a Rudy Gamo campaign in Michigan. Do you guys have anybody who can go over and support? So that's, it's really just having that nice network of people along with um, pro bono people who work with us. Um, so it really takes a lot of people to do what some people say, yeah, well, you know, you just got one or two people out, but the amount of time and energy and effort by so many different people to get that one person out is, I don't know anyone who could do it alone. Yeah. That's so it's, imp it's important. Yeah. I'd imagine that is a, a, a big a win for, to celebrate, okay. whether it's, you know, one person over the course of a year or one over a month. I mean, that's, that's the mission, right? Is to get the mission everyone is out. every, the mission's everyone, but people feel like, if you're not seeing someone get out every single day, there's not a ton of, of work being done on the back end. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So with that being said, I feel like knowing how slowly the government moves and at what pace it moves yeah. um, is something that, you know, go, getting our newsletter and going to our website and reading up and just seeing like, Hey, there's a lot getting done, but glacial pace. The, yeah. The, the wheels of bureaucracy move very slow. And then you add this global pandemic on it and it's even slower, frustratingly slow. So uh, how would you characterize the help you've received from the overall cannabis industry say well you got lpp but then there's the overall cannabis industry and and are there any specific partners you, you know whose contributions you'd like to highlight or any shout outs or you know that's kind of helped really kind of propel you through the wheels of bureaucracy <laughs> well obviously if there were no cannabis community no cannabis industry there would be no lpp because we are able to do what we do because of donations and because of the support we receive. So for me, coming, coming out of prison and receiving a grant, um, one of the wonderful things that we can say is last year we gave out over $600,000 in direct grants to people coming home. So people can apply, get a, uh, five up to a five thousand dollar grant, um, depending on what your needs are, and that makes a huge difference. That's like mm. the difference in 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 having to connect different buses to get to where you need to go to work, or buying a used car, and and being able to go to work and job interviews for a better job. So it's it's something that makes me so proud to say that because that money came from. The cannabis industry that money came from cannabis consumers who understand their privilege to be able to go yep. into a dispensary and purchase and go home and not get arrested and and for for people to build their dispensaries and to provide for their families so the help that we've gotten from so many there's so many different amazing brands that have been involved like i can't even pick out one like they're and, all yeah. awesome. When your, you know, founders Andrew and Steve, they're just exceptional fellas too. You know, I mean, been on the front lines since the '70s, 
whether it's bringing it you know to the mainstream or just fighting advocating for the plan itself and um so definitely you're all in good hands there and i think uh f for me and i'd love to know you know how how many prisoners right now around this country are still in a cell because of these minor infractions or conspiracy cases involved with it, cannabis it's extremely hard to narrow down an exact number because the system is so antiquated and yeah. and my question would be do they even really truly know um from what we can actually see on paper it's over forty thousand. Yeah. but those are just cannabis prisoners that's not cannabis and something else because yeah. that's a whole nother ball game when they want to throw in something extra with your cannabis. So that cannabis really and jaywalking, <laughs> right? We pulled you over because you smelled <laughs> cannabis and now you're here yeah. with the cannabis. Like, so it's hard to pinpoint the way that we do our outreach is really through word of mouth, through other prisoners, through the people that are on the outside, the families of someone who's been impacted getting in contact with us. And that really benefits because that money that we get from donations goes to commissary. People think prison's free. P prison is not free. In fact, it's a 30% markup on the real world. The only difference mm. is they're making 12 cents an hour mm. instead of $12 or whatever. They're making 12 cents. So you're paying more for soap, but you're getting paid less to, to go work in recycling and go through the garbage. So it's different. I don't know. It, it's one of those things that the money that someone gets on commissary, or they can use that money to, to make phone calls, to purchase stamps, to write home. Their families get support. Um, there's a lot of parents that are incarcerated and leaving behind a one parent household or a grandma taking care of their grandchild because their son and daughter-in-law's in prison for cannabis. So they can also get a grant through that family support. It's, it's really, for me, the most rewarding part of what I do is building these relationships with dispensaries and with brands and making it so that nobody in their inner circle can say they don't know someone who hasn't been impacted. Yeah. Right. So, so you, 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 you mentioned 40,000 on paper, but then exponentially the amount of families, friends, loved ones that have been affected. I would imagine that's probably 20 times that number. <laughs> I mean, from, from a place of recovery, you know, as a recovered alcoholic, a drug addict, uh, the data shows that up to 17 people for per one person that is addicted to drugs is affected. So the exponential compounded effect over years is astonishing when you really think about it. And broken families, those broken families maybe turn into the streets to turning to drugs, and it's just perpetuating a negative feedback loop. It's just perpetuating a big cycle. And, you know, addicts become homeless, homeless addicts are treated less than human, uh, addicts and homeless are getting thrown in jail because they're looked at as criminals instead of just a human that has mental health problems. So the work that you're doing definitely is across many different sectors of, of culture and societal work here. So, um, numbers is that's huge 40,000 exponential i mean it's hard to really put your finger on it so um some of the prisoners you're currently working with are are you able to tell us about them a little bit or you know some uh -huh. of the you know deep one work the, that you're doing yeah one of the other programs we do is a letter writing um campaign because one of the things that i i noticed in in my time was the be the treatment of people who didn't get letters, the treatment of people who 
didn't have money on their commissary and didn't get to go shopping on commissary day is, is very different. And that's a weird thing to, to see and say, but I guess the, the officers felt like if no one cares about you outside, we're not going to treat you any kind of way. But when they see you shop every week and they see you um, have money on your books and, and get letters from home and packages from home, they treat you different. They treat you better. And that trickles down to the treatment of, from other inmates. So getting letters to prisoners is, is something that I love. So we have a letter writing book um, and a letter writing guide and information on how you can write these prisoners a little bit about their story. Um, the people we're working on right now, um, Mr. Allen, his campaign just started. Uh, Rudy Gamo, I sat in on a parole hearing for him. And I it brought back so many memories for me, but I was so happy to be able to be on that call and be there to support him because he's fighting for his life and they're bringing up, well, you got in a fight. Tell us about the fight. You know, you, if you go to prison, you're going to fight over the microwave. So it's going to happen. <laughs> And it doesn't need to be brought up at a parole hearing. I don't, I don't think, yeah. but it's what they do. So we have the books and it just kind of has people mm. and their stories um, and people with their families, like people need to get home to their kids. So we, we have a lot of information about them. We want to magnify that and get more people um, on the outside to let us know about their impacted um, loved ones so we can work with them and help them. It's amazing. I like that letter writing campaign. I remember I had a pen pal when I was a kid, you know, and that's, <laughs> it's fun. It's enjoyable. So how many, uh, with the letter writing campaign, um, do you see that being effective? Or do you have a, a nice list of people that are actually engaged in writing letters? I mean, in, in the world we live in now, it's like who picks up a, a pencil or, or a pen and writes on paper? I mean, I, I do, but a lot of people, you know, the K, they just write, you know, in acronyms now, text. <laughs> and I remember people used to get letters from like churches and they would be like, just like photocopy letters and and they just send it to every single prisoner and i mean that's great but for me for people to know and these are people from our community our industry the cannabis industry writing them taking the time to say listen you're not forgotten and taking the time to write and i yeah. said i think that's really important um is taking that time to write so oh the first year we did the holiday letter writing campaign, I think they did maybe a thousand letters, wow. which is great. Um, this past Christmas, I designed a card um, with one of my prison skills that I learned, which is quilling. And I quilled the design and we made this card and I got to send them a note. And that's what people would write their cards to them. And I, I kept getting cards back to me because people thought I sent them the cards because I had like a note on the front that I made the card, but um, we did over, we distributed over 10,000 cards over our dispensary partners, over our brand partners, getting to see so many dispensaries and consumers and patients get involved and want to get involved. It, that was amazing. Mm. So yeah, I've heard from a lot of different family members like, Oh, you know, Umberto got your cards. He said, thanks. You know, so it, it makes me feel good that the community is relaying that you're not just there. Yeah. Like we're here, we see you and we welcome you when you get home. A little personal touch goes a long way. And I can only imagine being in prison, the time must move very slow. And to get something that is like handwritten with like a stream of consciousness coming from someone just gives a sense of connection as well. So that's, that's really powerful. So uh, jumping really into a larger kind of um, question here is uh, 
why hasn't our big old president, Mr. President Biden, stepped up to release federal prisoners or really do anything like capital letters anything like do something joe uh, to fulfill his own campaign pledges on cannabis and what are you hearing from your allies and and dc and kind of just an added bonus on there hit the vice president kamala she's wasn't too friendly with cannabis in california as our um <laughs> the da under gavin newsom so that's one thing I always bring up with people. Oh, there's a woman in, a woman in the White House. I'm like, yeah, but she was kind of against her own people in Oakland and, and San Francisco and across the whole state of California. And the numbers are astonishing. So why hasn't our presidential office stepped up? Well, okay. So first I'm going to say this. I am a person who comes from hope. And um, I, I respect politics. I, I get it. Mm -hmm. He did say he would do it. And she did admit that she inhaled. So I, I, I think early in the game, it's, it, it might be mid game. I, I, how do I say this? I feel like it will definitely come into play prior to the next election, which yeah. is sad to hear because as a felonite, one of the, the worst things that for me was the thought that I would not be able to vote and mm -hmm. then finding out that I actually can in California vote. That was like huge for me. So many people that have been impacted and come home think that. I always tell people, check with your probation officer, check, check the rules, ask everybody, ask anybody. Sometimes it doesn't work out for people. I've seen people arrested for trying to vote and thinking they could and they couldn't. But for me, it worked out and I cast my vote and I cast my vote with hope. Not to be used as a pawn. And unfortunately, it's kind of politics as usual yeah do i think something can happen i i really really believe that's going to be maybe the little ace in the hole type play but it's sad to me that that's the case because these yeah. are people's lives these are like you said families kids parents dying why you're all incarcerated for something like cannabis. Right. Um, so the I, answer to I, that is I don't know. I, I you, just believe uh, it's being held, held back. It's, it's one of these. You just, one of the most it's not a priority. spiritual things to say is just throw your hands up. I don't know. It's not a priority, but I like what you said. I vote with hope. I mean, that should be, you should make that as an LPP pin. Right, LPP. I vote with hope, Stephanie Shepard. Um, I'm going to bookmark that. We'll probably make uh, some content out of that. That's really good. Um, so, do you work with any expungements and explain the difference between having your record sealed mm -hmm. versus pardons and full expungements? Well, a pardon it, it forgives the offense. It um, cancels the punishment. You're 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 good to go from here on out. Uh, record sealing is just that the the offense remains. Just it's not open to the public, like anyone can look at my case. Um, so to have your record sealed, but it's only closed to some people and some. Um, organization so that record sealing i'm not sure about uh expungement is wiping your slate clean like it never happened which it should mm -hmm. happen automatically at this point right um some of the work that our policy team does is pushing that forward automatic expungement because 
I mean, a lot of people, first of all, don't have money to hire lawyers to go through an expungement process. Um, it's expensive. And to do it yourself, and you've just done 25 years in prison, yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, have fun. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> navigating it. I mean, some people can do it, but let's be honest, the majority of people, and especially people who have done a long time, they're coming out and they're elderly or they're older. They're really not. I'm struggling to catch on to an iPhone. I can't imagine how they're going to navigate. So yeah. um, to to be able to put yourself in the position to do it yourself, it'd be de- very difficult. So we try to work with um, attorneys who work with that. Uh, I'm actually going to Los Angeles tomorrow to an expungement clinic um, and a hiring a hiring fair within the cannabis industry. Um, so that should definitely want to reach out and hopefully get families or names of people who have been impacted because the, the help, it definitely helps for sure. Yeah. Uh, and as far as expungement with your record, are, are you still, do you still have that letter F? next year i do name. i'm still on i'm still on probation right so i'm still on supervised release um mm-hmm. i still have to report i still have to if i have contact with the police i have to let them know if i buy a new if i do stay in contact um where i am now is i just want off release early I want off supervised release early. So I'm actually working with a firm now through LPP that's um, working with me on filing that. So hopefully next time I talk to you, um, I will be off of supervised release, which means I can at least move a a little more freely and not have, have the concerns and worries every time I walk out if, you know, something happens and the police happen to come, I have to report it and chance a violation. I don't want that. Right. So here, here's a, something I just thought of is, okay, so you're on, you're on probation now. Cannabis is legal in the state that you are residing in right now. Are you able to? Or do you Absolutely. Have to? <laughs> Absolutely not. That's the other mind boggling thing. Right. Okay. So you're in you're in prison. Cannabis has become legalized or decriminalized in seventy five percent of the states in in our country and and the state that you um, c- quote convicted the crime or got picked up for in New York and you still can't use it. So even though uh, Mr. Probation officer, I'm suffering from some really terrible post traumatic stress syndrome from being in prison for 10 years. I'd love to just be able to have five milligram gummy or something. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's it. So it's just, it's just deep and deep and deep and all the entanglements of all these bureaucratic rules. So, and red tape so and something that um, when I turned, I mean, I was 28 and I smoked for the first time and I was like, okay, this is something that really resonates with me mind it may helps me focus i get things done Mm -hmm. and to to have this extra trauma on my back now and not have that to to rely on and to and to knowing that there's something there that can make me feel so much better and yeah it's still being denied yeah, uh, it, it's hard. I could. Imagine. I probably wouldn't cry so much if I could. If I could have a, a gummy or two. <laughs> Something. Just throw me a, <laughs> throw me a gummy here, PO. Uh, I have so many questions, but the the you know we're gonna wrap up here in a few minutes. But uh, you know you you've partnered with a bunch of brands. Medicine Box is is a partner of yours. We're we're very small. We're bootstrapped. We have a great team. We're super dedicated to the advancement of all plant medicines, but not forgetting the the social, cultural, political dynamics that have taken place. We don't want to bypass any of that. Now, you look at some of these like massive 
brands, Til- Tilray and Cario, and uh, I can't think of some of the others, but I, I choose to kind of ignore them because they're just like these big behemoths. Now, what what are some of these more like corporatized uh, companies, really umbrella companies that are being traded on the Canadian NASDAQ or going for Series A, Series B, Series C financing? Now, does LPP um, go and pitch them or is this more of you're working with the collective of like the OGs and the, the smaller brands that get this stuff, you know, cause I'd they, imagine if you landed one of those big whales, they, they could do a lot. The wonderful thing about what we do is help can come from anywhere and yeah. we'll accept help from anywhere. Um, if the messaging aligns, and if, if there's something, you can give us as much money, but if there's something off, if there's something not genuine about your, yeah. your intentions, then that's because I'm going to tell you, one of our most successful programs is the Roll It Up for Justice program, where when people go in and they purchase, they either donate a dollar or 420 if they're so inclined afterwards. That's coming from not it's not even costing the dispensaries or the brands any money when um, people participate in that. And that's, that does, that's one of our most success. So it could just be one store with some really dedicated clientele and, and they can easily send us a nice size donation. So it doesn't matter. um, It's the people who want to get involved. Those are the people, the people who, who understand what we're trying to do yeah. and want to be in, on the right side of it because it will change. Yeah. And it just depends kind of, I feel like even now, if you walk in somewhere, I always ask, do you have any women owned brands? Do you have any black owned brands? Do you have any social equity companies? I ask if I'm, if I were going in and purchasing i would ask those questions <laughs> you can shop you can window shop could you go in and yeah. window shop no <laughs> no you can't um, if I don't yes I don't if S- send in send in would, stephanie's assistant okay the probation <laughs> officer that is probably not listening stephanie is not going into dispensaries on record here just fyi oh. just want to let you all know that but uh just something just like super innovative and philosophical that we talk about with medicine box a lot is in the psychedelic industry that's a whole other beast that's happening that uh a part of every psychedelic business model there should be a percentage of that that goes to integration services right the the, the de- decompression or the re-entry back into reality if you will uh helping out with the uh, different cultural appropriations that have happened with getting psychedelics you know into the mainstream helping indigenous peoples that should be like baked into the business model and with cannabis you know using business as a tool for good or a tool for social justice. We feel very strongly that any of these businesses or new businesses that are being formalized should have something baked into their business model that whether it's 1% or a half percent that goes towards LPP or goes towards uh, prison reform or any type of social justice revolved around the war on drugs. And I'm just throwing that out there, hoping that someone hears this, whether you're an attorney, an investor, uh, someone that wants to do good by this plan and you've been using this plan or seeing the effects that it's had on friends, family, loved ones, put your money where your mouth is and um, do what you can. And that kind of brings me into the the final question here is that, you know, for those who want to help Last Prisoner Project um, or just cannabis prisoners in general, what's the best thing they can do? Where's a good starting point? Um, a good starting point is just going to our website, uh, www.lastprisoner.org. Um, and we have a take action page there. We have petitions that you can sign there. We have a petition calling for President Biden to 
just do what he absolutely can and is in the power to do, which is bring these people home. But he has to hear from people. He has to, if it's so easy to put on the back burner, the more people who let it be known that this is what we want. They say 70% of America is for legalization across the board. Well, if that can be the case, 70% of people need to let that be known. And signing petitions is one way. Um, Signing up for our newsletter. Obviously, we couldn't do the work we do without donations. Um, Our letter writing campaign, go through, read some of the stories, drop a letter. It's all right there. Um, And and use your, your, your spending power Mm -hmm. with places that want to be involved that that yeah. care about getting because honestly the more people doing the work is the quicker it will happen so you right. know if other organizations grow the way that last prisoner project has grown then that's a lot of people doing work and getting the message out there so it's part of the big reason why we're we're doing this and we've we spent time tracking someone down and LPP to have this conversation because it's it's a good message to put out there. It will live on our website, our YouTube, Instagram, and it, all it takes is one set of eyeballs and one pair of ears to, to hear the message that resonates. And um, before we go, just something that's funny and maybe just lighten up the, the conversation a bit. Um, you, you mentioned a quilling prison, uh, a prison skill set. Like, I know people that have gone to prison, my cousin, friends, like they've learned a lot. Like that quilling's one. What are two other things that you learned? Prison. That's a, that's good. Like a good skill sets to have. I mean, it, it wasn't, wasn't all waste, you know, 10 it, years, it, no, no, it wasn't actually. I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot yeah. about um, humbling myself. Mm-hmm. And, and now I come out a better version of me. I feel like so um, no quicker way to humble yourself than to go to prison. Um, I learned some pottery. Nice. I learned some beading. I took, I I have an entire folder of very useless certificates that I got from every single class that I took and taught because I was an English teacher. So I taught ESL to people who didn't speak English. Oh, that's awesome. Let's so. put that put that in a collage and make it a wall of fame. So one uh, day, what and and a gift f- from me to um, in Medicine Box to the Last Prisoner Project is an introduction um, from my attorney Joseph Elford. Uh, he was the former uh, attorney general. Uh, uh, general counsel for Americans for safe access. And they represented 135,000 patients nationwide. Joseph just, uh, he, after three years, he helped finalize a case uh, that I was involved in. Um, My farm got raided in November of 2017, right at the cusp of legalization in California. So we were kind of in that juxtaposition of Prop 215, medical adult use, and there was a lot of just bogus things that occurred with search warrants and all that, and I can't really say too much. Uh, but we ended up settling on that case, and everyone just kind of went their separate ways. And we, we settled uh, a month ago, and um, I let Joseph know that I was working with Last Prisoner Project, and he's a full-on you know, he's all about advocacy and cannabis and he would like me to introduce y'all to him. So I'm going to do that. We have your email, Katie left, uh, but we'll get that introduction going. And Joseph, I think would be a great um, asset to the organization. He's in San Francisco um, and just a phenomenally smart guy that um, gets cannabis law and gets reform. So that's kind of our well, thank you so for, much for all of that... you guys. And um, I'm pulling up the chat here. Um, Jeff just jumped on. Uh, so we, you know, anyone that's listening, we will be launching Roll It Up for Justice um, in our Shopify store in March. Um, we'd love to get involved with 
the cards and letter writing for the Christmas campaign. And this is from Alana. We should donate equanimity to reentry program. So equanimity is our uh, nervous system calming, serotonin boosting, very spiritually amplifying, keep you mellow. Um, and we do have a version that does not have THC in it. And it has all these really yummy herbs in there. So maybe we could talk to someone over there at LPP to get some bottles donated for reentry to help calm that nervous system when you're running around looking for a job at Starbucks in two <laughs> weeks' time. So. Definitely. Thank um, you so much. It's been you're uh, welcome. amazing. And next time I speak to you or hopefully see you, maybe it will be at a cannabis event or down in Sacramento you and I can step into a dispensary together and I will purchase you a pre-roll and we can walk out of that dispensary and walk down the street in Sacramento and light up a pre-roll together. So I look forward to that day. One day. <laughs> okay. One day. I look forward to it. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Thanks for being you, being transparent with your story and everything that you're doing with LPP and spreading the message and i look forward to seeing the success as the years and months and decades roll on so thanks <laughs> let's for joining. hope not i'm looking forward to being out of this job so <laughs> okay <laughs> good bye bye thanks everybody <laughs>